Good evening and welcome to tonight's um, finance subcommittee of the Brockton School Committee, Tuesday, March 30th. Um, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency, on March 12th, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order temporarily suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20. Pursuant to the order, public bodies are temporarily relieved from the Open Meeting Law's requirements that the meeting be held in public places, open and physically accessible to the public, so long as measures are taken to ensure the pu public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative means. This meeting will be held and will be accessible to the public via Brockton Community Access, Brockton Public Schools website, www.bpsma.org, YouTube, and Comcast Channel 98. The public can access this meeting via the following link, www.youtube.com forward slash the Brockton Channels. <clears throat> Before we get into the agenda, I'm going to call the roll to establish a quorum. <clears throat> Mayor Sullivan. Here. Vice Chair DeHagostino is here. Ms. Asak. Here. Mrs. Mendez. Here. Mr. Minicello. Mr. Rodriguez. Here. Mrs. Sullivan. Here. Mr. Sullivan. I know he's on a delay. He can't hear. Oh, he's there. I don't think he can hear. He didn't answer. Okay. Well, we see him. I think that <laughs> he's here. <laughs> All right. Mr. Sullivan, can you just say uh, present? Tim oh. Sullivan is present. Thank you, Tim. Okay, yeah. All right, good. Okay, so we have two items on the finance agenda for the evening, the FY 2022 school department budget and other business. Um, Superintendent, if you want to take the floor and go over to the budget matter with us. Yes, thank you, Mr. D'Agostino. So as we continue to uh, prepare um, our FY22 budget, uh, we wanted to tonight spend some time um, focusing in on um, guidance counselor positions, adjustment counselor positions, um, and some positions we need for support staff. Um, and then next week we'll come to you um, with all the other certified uh, positions, which are uh, mostly teaching positions and other certified positions that we'll go over next week um, so we can basically prepare to um, send the mayor a budget from the school committee um, in early May. So, um, so last week, as you know, we focused on um, operations. Uh, this week, we're going to focus on social emotional needs of, 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 of students and what we need to hire for that and then some paras and MTAs uh, that are needed as well. Um, and then next week, when we continue next Tuesday night, uh, finance will focus all on certified staff that's gonna be needed. And, um, and then shortly after that, we'll co come to you with some curriculum needs um, that we're gonna need as well going forward. So, but I think we will be able to have our public hearing on the budget and be able to send um, a budget to the mayor uh, in early May. I know Aldo is zooming in with us tonight. Still no sound? Right. Well, while we're... Is there no sound going out or no sound coming in? Going out. Okay. All right, let's call him again, Aldo. What's that? Is it, can you call Aldo again? He should be able to hear you now. Mr. Petronio, can you hear us? I can hear you now, but it kind of echoes a little bit. Okay. All right. So, all right. Now we got you. All right. So you want to go ahead with your... Can you share your screen, Aldo, and I can walk everybody through? And Sharon, I believe, is with us as well. So I'm actually going to have Sharon join us when we talk about our guidance counselors and our school adjustment counselors. So... Um, Al, you, can you make that the whole screen or no? That's fine. We can see it. If you can make it a little bit larger. 
Thank you. Uh, all right, we, we got it. So um, first we're going to start out with um, guidance counselors. Again, these were positions that we focused on last year that we actually had approved back in March of last year. And then obviously due to COVID, um, that changed our, our plan. So um, Sharon, you're with us, correct? There she is. Can you hear us? Not good. We got you. Fade in. No, we can hear you. In and out. Oh, we're fading in and out? I can hear you. Yeah. Hear you. Yeah. We have you fading out, Sharon. All right, I can I can jump in um, till we figure that. Sharon, is it better now? Oh, I can't hear. You. Yeah, so wireless. Yeah. With the yeah. internet. I'm gonna get on the phone with our network. Should I should have grabbed? Okay, I'll walk you through. Um, Sharon, we're having an issue with the laptop. That's the Zoom in laptop with uh, internet access. So, um, all right, so I'll walk you through number one. Uh, these are guidance counselors. As you know, we all know guidance counselors help prepare our students um, with their schedule, uh, with their career and college plans right from middle school up through high school. Um, we are looking to add two at Brockton High School. As you know, there right now there are three in each building, uh, and there's a couple others that work for voca with vocational programs. Uh, there's one that also works with our teen um, uh, our teens um, that are um, in the Project Grad program. We also have a guidance counselor um, that works with a lot of our athletes, um, and so and then we have three guidance counselors on top of that for each of the buildings that cover you know the cover the alphabet. So, um, so we would need two more at Brockton High School, and Dr. Murray wants them to focus on um, our students that are in danger of failing, our whistle list, uh, which um, focuses on mostly freshmen who are struggling when they come up to Brockton High School. Freshmen are um, a challenge in all high schools, especially large urban high schools, so we like to see them get more support. Um, so we're looking for two additional guidance counselors that would s spend a lot of time focused on um, students who are struggling in school, um, help um, get them back on track, work with their teachers, and also um, help make their college plans. They, they would stay with these students throughout the, their four years. Um, so this is two, two positions that Dr. Murray's uh, request and that I'm, uh, you know, that I agree with. And Next is um, five for our middle schools. So that would be, right now, each middle school has one guidance counselor. Um, we would add five. We would stay right now at one for north because they'll have just a sixth and seventh grade. And then next year, we can talk about adding a second one to north. But right now, um, that would send an extra no, guidance maybe. counselor. No. What? I texted Melinda so she knows. hand it back to you and we're going to start with guidance counselors we'll start at the top again motion to adjourn <laughs> <laughs> uh, i guess everyone heard i guess everyone heard me i, I guess everyone heard my test okay good just kidding <laughs> all right so you were covering the um yeah, I'll let you, I'll let, we'll start at the top because I think a lot of people didn't hear us. So we're starting with guidance counselors. Can you see Aldo's screen? Hand it back to you and let's 
start with guidance counselors. We'll start at the top. Oh, is that me? So uh, the guidance counselors for Brockton High School, um, as the superintendent was sharing, um, there are two counselors that we are requesting so that we can really target support for our struggling incoming ninth graders. We have had good success by identifying those students and having a counselor working directly with them, but the need is greater than one person can fill. Um, and our guidance counselor loads are in the high 200s. And so this would give an opportunity for us to really uh, put some supports in place for those students who come into high school struggling the most. Uh, um, and it will allow counselors to have caseloads that are more manageable so that they can do more in-depth work across the board. And so those two positions would really target ninth graders, but in general, having the additional support at the school is going to be beneficial overall. And at the middle school level, as you know, uh, our head of guidance was shifted to a 12 month, six to 12 position uh, previously. And in looking at the way we deliver services, uh, it's clear that the types of services in really the college career readiness and the real academic support uh, focused, you know, helping students prepare for the next levels, understand the testing that they have to do, even even identifying some things that are meaningful for them so that they understand why the academic pathways that we have are so important. Uh, the middle schools need additional support as well. Um, and so the middle schools were looking at adding an additional guidance counselor to each of the middle schools so that there are a team of people really wrapping the services around helping students identify pathways, understand um, even access to higher level courses and, and planning uh, as they transition each grade. And then we're hoping that by having more support with guidance, we can actually do a better job at transitioning students from elementary to middle and then from to high school because the points are where we see students struggling the most and in reality where we oftentimes lose students and so that extra help will will benefit all of the schools in and really providing better services for all students do you want me to just keep any going questions for sharon this before we move on to adjustment counselors go on to adjustment counselors okay yep. so for this the school adjustment counselors, as you know, we've added additional counselors this year, and we're we're really getting to a place where we're in uh, good shape across the board with with counselors. We're in the process now of doing interviewing and making recommendations based on the counselors that you approved for additions this year. Uh, we are asking uh, for two more counselors, school adjustment counselors for the high school, for but two per building. And when you're looking at a school that uh, historically has had uh, around 4,000 students, the idea of two per house is is um, really the goal we had many years ago. And the fact that we're able to get to this point where we're talking about it and can do it is really a testament to your commitment to, to providing these services and to our school system um, dedicated to the social emotional well-being of our students. And so that would put two at high school. We are also asking for one position to be added. And by adding that one position, it would allow our two part-time uh, school adjustment counselors who are doing a job share, each are ready to return to full-time uh, work. And that would allow for those two counselors to then, uh, instead of share a job, be full-time each. And so they would stay in the locations that they're in, but do full-time work. And then uh, the Davis, because uh, to add one more uh, adjustment counselor would get them to three counselors. So a school with about a thousand elementary and middle school kids would then be at three adjustment counselors with the addition of one next year. So this is what we, we again we tried to do last year with um, and then COVID hit. So our goal was in your larger elementary schools. Um, that have seven, eight, nine hundred students, we would be at three adjustment counselors. 
Um, at every middle school, we would go to two adjustment counselors. Uh, at Brockton High, which, again, we wish we could have done this a long time ago. We only used to have four. Um, now we've had, we have six. Now, now we will go to eight, like Sharon said, to have two for, per building, which is long, long overdue. Um, and then on your, at your, um, again, the smaller elementaries will have two adjustment counselors, uh, and your middle schools will each have two adjustment counselors. And again, the Davis being K through eight would have three. Um, this is a major step forward, and we know um, it's much needed for um, our students coming out of um, what's happened with the pandemic and, and being remote and everything that's taken place and, our, you know, the struggles that they've had uh, and the struggles their families have had. So, you know, these um, guidance and these uh, adjustment council positions, uh, um, obviously, we strongly recommend. And you have always supported, so I appreciate that. Um, if I can jump in. So I know, and, and I mean, I think we know that this is needed and we know what's been cut over the last 10 years. And so I don't think that's, but we also, uh, in our district review, one of the comments was last year we had slated a bunch of positions and didn't present the evidence to support them. So uh, in the, that spirit or, or, or that context, if you will, um, can you kind of give us some supportive background? Because again, it was something that we were that we were you know marked down for. Absolutely. So um, the the addition of guidance and adjustment councils, as Sharon spoke about it, it um, actually, especially with guidance that will help students um, prepare better for college um, or career. It helps them transition easier from. Uh, uh, elementary to middle, then middle to high school. Um, and, you know, they do a lot of, guidance counselors do a lot of uh, work in, with the students on their interests and try to find things to help, um, you know, obviously fit their interests and get them involved in clubs, extracurricular activities, um, so they become part of a school. And uh, as we know, students involved in extracurricular activities, you know, do better academically in school. So guidance counselors spend a lot of time on doing that with, with our students. Um, and then obviously adjustment counselors, it's all about social emotional well-being. Um, and that, that's everything. That's improving attendance rates when students are struggling to come to school. Um, if students are having anger issues, they deal with that. They deal with helping to have the child work together with their, with their parents. If things, uh, you know, they're struggling in school, they get the parents involved um, to try to uh, remedy those situations. Um, adjustment counselors help reduce suspension rates, which we're trying to do and, and pretty much eliminate out-of-school suspension when we can. Um, and they work for stu with students around uh, those things. Sharon will jump in and, and, and tell you more. She spends a lot more time than I do. But I can just tell you from my years being uh, an assistant dean at the high school and a dean at the high school, uh, after your assistant principal or your assistant dean, the next person you usually go to is your adjustment counselor. Because when students are struggling, that's who you usually call in. Um, and again, they, they serve a lot of per and they support teachers. They, they spend a lot of time with our teachers around strategies uh, for classroom management um, to improve, again, keeping kids in the classroom, reducing suspension rates, improving attendance rates, and it's all tied into, obviously, the goals that we're trying to accomplish. So, Sharon, you, I must have missed some things, and there's other, like, they work with mobile crisis when students are in crisis. Some of them are there late hours with the principal and the assistant to help students that are in crisis, they follow up with the home, they follow up with the hospitals, and there's a bunch of stuff I'm leaving out that Sharon can jump in, so I'll stop talking now, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you cover quite, quite a bit of what they do, and I think when you look at our academic achievement data and the number of students who are going into, you know, higher level classes or choosing some of the vocational pathways and things that we offer, you can see the need for the guidance piece to be strengthened. And really, uh, the transitional pieces is always an area that it, we've always had concerns with and struggles with. To really be able to develop some guidance programming that supports that across the board and strengthens those uh, 
transitions for students and those opportunities for students is, is a vital piece of the work. Um, and of course, the things that Mike just mentioned in terms of the school adjustment counselors, uh, there is all of that and all of the schools were trying to roll out PBIS. Uh, we have to put uh, a, we have to put systems in place. Uh, we have schools that are working on restorative justice as as a way in which to deal with uh, some of the concerns that happen in a school. And the school adjustment counselors are part of all of that. They're written into students' IEPs oftentimes, so providing services that way. Um, and really being in the building and and when something happens, um, it can take a person away all day. And if that person is away all day, then that means the support um, can't be there for a the key is to make sure that we have enough support in the building because we'd like to believe that um, every child would come and have a great day and never need a school adjustment counselor, but we also know that's not realistic and there's not downtime for them in any day because um, they are supporting students in their uh, development of social skills, in meeting their uh, IEPs, in working with students and families on a variety of issues. Some are school related and some are wraparound services that we really need to provide so that students are feeling safe, comfortable, and able to learn when they're in class. And so their roles are, are vital to the building and to, to supporting the, the overall growth and achievement of students. Great. Thank you both for, for that. I just, I know that was something that we had gotten pushed back on, so I wanted to make sure we had that conversation. So I appreciate it. Um, any other member of the committee? Um, Mr. Rodriguez. Um, on the system wide, it, it states six positions and then BHS two. So is that a total of eight for BHS? Or is that broken down different? That's I'm just broke. trying to the understand system, exactly how it's broken down. The system ones we added um, about two months ago when the ESSER money came in, um, knowing that we were dealing with COVID. So those positions were um, advertised and they've been they're now um, doing interviews for these six so those six had system-wide that would give you with those six in the additional um, so the additional four that will give you the eight at Brockton High the three at every large um, elementary school two at every smaller elementary school so the smaller elementary schools are going from one to two adjustment counselors. Brockton High is going from six to eight. Um, then you're going from um, middle schools going from one to two, and your larger elementaries are going from two to three. So that this six that have are, they're in the process to be high, hired that we went through with this the ESSA two money, um, and now with the extra four that gets us to where we pretty much where we wanted to be last year when we submitted the budget on March third and then had to pull the plug for COVID. So that gets us to the levels that we've been wanting to be at for a long time. But thanks, that's a good question. And um, second part to that is, um, I know like with the job descriptions, it's broken down. When we're looking at these adjustment councils, are we, um, are we focusing on um, the bilingual aspect of it, knowing that you know our schools have a large population of bilinguals, Cape Verdean, Asian, and Hispanic? Yep, Sharon, you want to answer that one? I know that that's a request also that the principals make. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what the uh, question um, was. Adjustment counselors that speak a second language that our students speak. Do the adjustment language some do, and in the hiring um, that we are currently involved in, uh, we are really pushing to find people who are bicultural and bilingual because uh, the need for students to have access to someone who speaks um, their primary language or can communicate well with their families uh, if they're not English speakers is vital and we have translation services that we use but it's really um, very helpful to have the counselor or one of the counselors in the building have um, those language and culture capabilities to really connect with families in ways. 
um, that we know we need. So that has been really a commitment of the principals who are currently hiring to get those positions in place that you approved earlier. And it's definitely a commitment of the department to, to ensure that um, we are diversifying our counseling staff and really supporting the, the language and culture needs of our students and families. All right, um, anyone else? And I just, I don't wanna leave out the members who are on Zoom. Uh, Tim, Mr. Minicello, either of you? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, thanks, Sharon. Um, next is uh, special education. Um, we need, and uh, Aldo and I met with Laurie uh, Mason today. Uh, we need eight uh, paraprofessionals uh, district-wide. And obviously those will be filled in in locations where we would need them, depending on the numbers at each school. And, and sometimes we have to add special education classrooms because the class size gets too large. So these would be si eight system-wide paras that could end up at, at any building. Um, and then we also have eight um, system-wide MTA. So these would be special education paraprofessionals and special education MTAs. So that's a total of 16 uh, for special education for next year. Uh, and then paras, um, we need um, eight system-wide building paras, and that is to get to where we wanted to be, you know, uh, last year where every elementary school principal um, could use a para for kindergarten classes and the new pre-K classes where we're starting. Um, that we're bringing in under our SOA plan uh, is to obviously when we changed the start date um, for our students and um, we rolled it back so now we um, we're, we're opening more pre-k classes so um, so these paras these 13 um, would help the building principals be able to um, fill in paras at at the kindergarten and other areas where they need them and pre-k as well Again, another thing we had last year for, and we know we all know the importance of how hard paras work and what they, especially as we all have recognized what they've done um, over the last year and um, how much they um, work with the teacher and work with our kids and with the principal. So always very important job to have um, in our school. So um, that's building paras system-wide. Then clerical paras at the middle schools we used to have a clerical para that would serve the adjustment counselors and the guidance counselors. That was eliminated years ago. Um, there's a ton of phone calls that have to be made, a ton of paperwork and documentation. So we're asking for um, three clerical paras for middle schools, um, and those would split schools. So each one of them would split uh, and service two middle schools each. So the one week they spend three days at a middle, like, so one one week one of those clerical paras will spend three days at east and the other two days at Plouffe, and then the next week they would rotate uh, we had these years ago and then obviously budget cuts made us eliminate them um, and then we would add two clerical paras for brockton high school each one of the the, the guidance suites where the uh, guidance counselors are located they always had clerical paras again years of budget cuts we cut down to two um, so those two would have to rotate amongst four, among four offices. Now with bringing two back, that each, each one of the guidance suites would have their own clerical para. That pretty much serves, well, now they'll be serving more. They'll serve about five to six guidance counselors in each suite. So, um, so that is what we need for paras. I don't take any questions on those two. Special education paras are um, the building paras or clerical paras. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, I just have, and again, in the same spirit of how I've asked some of these questions, but um, with the clerical paras, you know, obviously we have to make sure that the SOA money, we're using it in a way that directly impacts students. So can you, I mean, I kind of have some ideas in my head of what that impact will be, but I, if you can kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, it's all about supporting not only the um, the uh, the guidance counselors and the adjustment counselors, but also the students. Um, you know, they it's a ton of paperwork and documentation that has to take place. Um, as we all know, 
the documentation that um, has to be kept by adjustment counselors when they're dealing with students with emotional and social needs. Um, there's a ton of paperwork that comes with that, but it's also if you th stop and think of what the guidance counselors have to keep, you know, student schedules, make sure they print out all the schedules, email all the schedules, keep parents updated when there's a change of schedule or if a parent requests a, a change in classes. Um, you know, Brockton High School, we do over 4,200 schedules. And each guidance council, I think, and I want to say, Sharon, you can correct me, each guidance council used to have about 280 to 300 students that they are responsible for. Um, and the paperwork that comes with not only uh, keeping their schedule stay straight, um, making sure that um, all their co college applications are updated and get out on time to make so when students are applying for early college or just applying for college, all the SAT um, information they have to keep. So these clerical parents support not only the, the guidance counselors with all that paperwork and phone calls, they support the adjustment council as well with all the paperwork and phone calls that they have to make. Right, and I would imagine taking all of that off the, the adjustment counselors and guidance counselors frees them up to, to spend more time with students and do more with, with and for students. Absolutely. Right. Uh, anyone else have questions on this? All right, thank you. Welcome, and then finally, um, our system-wide MTAs, again, will be used when needed, uh, depending on um, the needs of each building. Uh, so we, again, we meet with all principals and we meet with all um, to see what they need. Um, and again, these are requests by them. And I just also want to add that um, the numbers here aren't as big as last year because from January to the present time, we've added several MTAs in Paris. Um, as you know, we needed to cover classrooms, um, for teachers that are teaching remotely. Um, and students were coming back in in the hybrid model. So we have the, right now you have the teacher zooming into the class and then you have a paraprofessional that's covering that room uh, or an MTA. So over the last few months with, you know, ESSER money that's come in, we've hired several paras and MTAs to make sure the, the buildings had what they needed. So we're up in numbers of paras and MTAs. None of them are being eliminated. They're being carried forward to next year. So this is additional positions on top of what we've hired over the last three months. Um, and I meant to ask this earlier. I've heard a bit from a, a few schools in the past about um, how I guess they used to have a para per kindergarten classroom. Um, does this get us to that or are we still or, or closer? It gets us to be able to put a para in every kindergarten classroom. Um, but we call them building paras now. Okay. So basically, we want them in kindergarten classrooms, but there are some days when the principal's up against it with maybe three or four, sometimes six people out. Right. And sometimes they have to be pulled, and we don't want to, but sometimes they have to be pulled to cover uh, other classes. And, um, but this, this, these numbers will get you to where the principal would be able to put a para in every kindergarten and pre-K class. Great. That's wonderful. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Aldo, you want to wrap it up? Want me to wrap it up, you said? Well, I just want you to do over the total funding, and you can wrap it up. Okay. Well, like I said, from this year's budget to next year's budget, we received about a a little over 18 million overall um, in Student Opportunity Act money in Chapter 70. Of that, we've got about 10 million of it covering costs we had this year that were covered by grants and positions we put in place, seeing this money coming in. So we've got about 8 million of discretionary spending, maybe eight and a half, um, which is what we're looking at for all these positions um, and other, you know, uh, curriculum and other items moving forward. The um, we will use the S or two monies as best as we can for one-time purchases and try and balance our budget um, with any recurring costs off of the Chapter 70 and the Student Opportunity Act funds that we receive. So that's what that's what these additions here in the last meeting, that's what we're looking to is take it from that eight million, eight and a half. 
Any questions for Aldo? Okay. All right. So then, uh, again, next week, uh, next Tuesday night, we'll spend a lot of time on our, um, certified staff. Um, we'll see how that goes. We might we might need to add a meeting next week. Um, okay. Just want to make sure that we go over, as Mr. Diago Zeno said, the the importance of making sure there's a rationale behind every position, because uh, it was again in our district review that um, you know we need to make sure that there's data decisions driven decisions behind positions we're bringing back. The positions at school need to be tied to the school improvement plans, the sta sustainability plans. Um, also, it's a, you know it's about looking at class size. Um, looking at again all about supporting teachers with you know with extra help that needs to come into back into our buildings and again these are the first steps in the first year of rebuilding back the Brockton Public Schools from years of budget cuts uh, but also doing it in a way that supports academic achievement right. excellent and obviously yeah I mean we it's great that we're now better funded you know but Obviously, we need to be careful how we use it and how we rebuild and, and just be smart about, you know, looking at, because, I mean, you know, we all know what we've lost in the past, but in coming back, you know, we may not necessarily rebuild exactly the way it was. You know, it may, because things have changed over the last 10 years, make sense to rebuild in a, in a little bit different way. So I appreciate the, the work that's going to go into getting ready for the next few finance meetings, because I know that you know you and you know we've talked about it that you've got to have the the backup to justify every everything um and and just to jump in quickly I yeah. mean, when you've when we've cut and i think we did these numbers over the last 10 years i think it was close to 80 million dollars that was you had to cut uh, one of the years 16 million as we all remember that number well 12 million 13 million so Remember, I mean, it, I think it adds up to about seventy-eight million that was cut over, I think, eight or nine-year period. Yeah. Um, it's important to note that um, that it's going to take just one. It's going to take more than just one year. This is this plan that we go in place to build the system back is a three-year process. Right. I mean, positions that we bring back this year isn't going to make us whole. Um, there's a it is a there's a long there's a building back process that's just not going to happen in one year. Like every position that we put in is not uh, this year is, you know, not going to solve the problems of the past, ten. you know, 10 years. But it will, again, start to build us back. It's methodically done, put in the right areas as we build back the school system. But this is a three year process. And hopefully the SOA continues to be funded that way. Right. Exactly. Hopefully they continue to fund it because you're right. It, one year is not going to replace 10 years. Um, but uh, so great. And uh, just to make sure I'm clear, you, you, we wouldn't, you don't need any votes on this. This would be part of the overall budget. It would be about when we passed, the, when right. we, we agree to, um, you know, recommend the final right. budget to the mayor. All right. Um, Mrs. Sullivan. I just wanted to ask um, the superintendent, in the past we've had um, like a shortage of powers. We weren't able to really fill the positions. I'm not sure about the MTAs. Um, do you think, we're, right think now, we'll be able to fill these para I'm hoping. Um, right now we have probably, I want to say there's about 20 unfilled para jobs. Um, I don't think that, I think maybe only two or three MTA positions. Um, so again, we'll con we continue to put ads out and hopefully um, as we move forward into September, we'll be able to, we've actually had some pretty good luck um, compared to what I hear from other systems when I'm in meetings with superintendents, it's been a real struggle for them to hire. I've gotten a real good response from principals that they've been able to find really good people, Brockton people, people of color, um, who again, coming in as PAR, as MTAs, as we're gonna get into our system and then hopefully help them get certified and become teachers and it's part of our grow your own. But I think I'm pleasantly surprised because when we started looking back right after the, the um, the, the holiday vacation, you know, winter vacation, all you heard is you couldn't find people. And I know, um, Mrs. Sullivan, you probably see that in the district you work with. Yes. Um, it's yeah. been, but we've been, the principals have really given us a good response that they, ha they have been able to find and hire some really good people. Right, we've been lucky in that area because I was nervous about being able to staff the schools for the hybrid return and obviously now looking for a full return, K to eight. Um, 
I've been pleasantly surprised I've been able to fill a lot of positions. Right, and, I, and again, I not only thank the principals that HR has pretty much worked around the clock. Kathy Moran and her team have really worked hard to, you know, make sure they reach out to these people, get the quarries done, get the interviews done and process the hiring, um, go through the hiring process as fast as they possibly can, um, obviously with the approved quarries and fingerprints. Uh, but HR has done an amazing job along with our school uh, principals, associates, and assistants really working hard to hire people and find good people. And we've been able to get a lot of good, you know, local community Brockton people to, to come in and work, which is great. Right. And the, um, the substitutes is another thing that's really a shortage. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we'll have, we, substitutes has been low because a lot of people just haven't, you know, we haven't obviously had the need for it because uh, we're just coming back to school. We still, you know, we obviously advertise for substitutes, but the substitute pool is low. Hopefully it goes up for next September. Um, we'll have to see how that, that goes. And we'll, we'll, what we can do again in a, uh, another finance meeting, we can review the substitute pay and take a look at that. That might be something we might want to think of adjusting a little bit to try to attract some more substitutes. But, you know, we can bring that forward in a, in a later finance meeting. Right, because the... Um I just wanted to emphasize the importance of the paras and the MTAs because during the COVID, I mean, I was in, I'm in a school and, I, and when the teacher gets sick, there's no one and someone has to take the class. Yep. So these people stepped in and, you know, they know the flow of the classroom so they can take over for until the teacher comes back. So they're really important to have in schools. Um, and Absolutely. they just do a lot of behind the scenes stuff that the teacher, you know, because the teacher is responsible for so much that these people uh, are really great coming in and the things that they do all, right. all for the kids, you know? Yep. They, they've, again, we know that they don't get paid a lot of money, right. um, but they, they always show up. They always work hard. They work well with our teachers. They become a fabric of each one of the schools. They're part of the, of the faculty and staff. And you also remember that they, they're the ones who ride the vans and the buses, um, which is not an easy job. Uh, and they do it, you know, all the time and uh, support our kids, support their families. So, again, we could not have a school system if it wasn't for our parents and MTAs, obviously. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and I, I echo that, your comments. I mean, the... the importance of paras can't be stressed enough i didn't realize just how uh, for lack of a better way to put it i don't want to say versatile but i guess that is the, i mean there's a, such a wide array of work that they do in the school and many it, i mean from acting as a substitute to just all the support work they do and working with kids and um you know i didn't realize just how much they did and how involved they were and, until you know the last round of of contracts when i was involved in in that bargaining unit's contract and looking at all the things that they do and that they're involved in they really are such a vital role and really important and and during a lot of the cuts i did have teachers reaching out look if you can't afford to bring more teachers on try and get some more paras we need the help it was paras that the teachers themselves were asking for and i think that's an important note and i'm you know they they, they really are a, a a really important part of the district. So uh, any other members of the committee? Mayor, please. Thank you. I just want to uh, thank the superintendent. I want to thank Sharon and Aldo. Um, I mean, these are positions that are needed, uh, needed um, sooner than later. Um, and, you know, we have to invest money into resources, uh, including people resources. And these uh, individuals that serve in these capacities are, uh, you know, they're, they're extremely um, beneficial to the future of Brockton Public Schools. So I look forward to, uh, again, working with Aldo and Troy on the city side and, and Mike. Uh, but I do, do want to thank uh, Sharon Walder as well. Uh, she's been really uh, doing a lot of uh, deep dives on this. So kudos to everybody. Thank you. All right. Any other member of the committee? Mr. Rodriguez, please. One more thing. It's not about... Not about turf fields, Aldo. <laughs> um, I know with the sacks, um, you know, I know they, you know, refer the, some of the students to, you know, different uh, 
like I said, services uh, that they need. I was just wondering, um, anybody else wants to chime in on this, is, you know, dealing with the, you know, with the COVID, um, we know a lot of students are affected. Um, mental health is a big, big issue in today's society. I mean, we deal with it in prison. It's, a, it's the number one. And a lot of this mental health starts at a very young age. Um, I was wondering uh, if we can look into the school district looking at getting a mental health professional to, you know, attack this and and see what we can do on the school side. So um, sh we do have some, so I have Sharon. Sharon, do you want to jump in and talk about our uh, interventionists and um, school psychologists? And I think she's still with us. So for some, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing his questions. Um, so, um, and it could just be the way the microphone is angled, but I'm only picking up parts of the question. So, um, Mr. Rodriguez was asking about, you know, in addition to the adjustment counselors, you want us to look in for mental health professionals. But uh, I know a lot of our adjustment counselors do hold that license. But also, uh, if you can chime in about our, um, our behaviorists, our interventionists, and also our school psychologists. So prior to um, closure, we had started to put in tier two behavior interventionists. Uh, there were four at the high school. Uh, we have now added, um, last year we added one to uh, the Asheville. So far we've added another one to West just recently and uh, to the plug weeks ago, the goal was to get some behavior interventionist in uh, to the schools, especially at the middle school level as well. Um, and I hear you, the work that we've had to do in terms of support um, during COVID and during all of the uh, George Floyd protest, and as you all know, the trial is coming. And so the, the stress of all of that is resurfacing for a lot of people. Um, and even some of the, one of the teachers reached out recently about comments um, that kids are starting to hear and repeat in terms of uh, bias against Asian uh, students and people because of um, some of the things that they heard related to the COVID virus. So the work is, is never ending. Um, and the struggles and stress that students have had and the impact it has had on mental health overall um, is that collective of trauma that we talk with kids are experiencing it as well and so when we you don't always know how someone is internalizing or processing something but uh, we always have to remember that behavior is a, is communicating something and oftentimes it's easier to try to uh, address the behavior and not figure out the root cause of the behavior and so the more we are able to add positions the positions that we've talked about and the positions that currently exist by the way um the more that we're able to really support people in uh honing in on those behaviors and working together as a team the better we are relying on suspensions and removals from class to address behaviors, but really um, to push in supports even into classrooms uh, and support people in really figuring out the causes. But uh, we spent a lot of time talking about relationship building and we've had um, the luxury in some ways of having parents in our classrooms through the remote learning and for us to have access to homes to see uh, our kids in their home environments. And so using that as a way to really help support and build relationships it is going to help uh, build that trust for students in the schools. And so uh, there are multiple layers to this work and there are some things that rise to the surface as uh, being more immediate in terms of needs and there are other things that um, that sense of things being normal and getting to come back and be around your friends and being able to socialize even in a different way has been really helpful to students who just couldn't wait to get back to school or once they got back and realized that 
they could adapt to the changes, but it gave them that sense of something is getting back to normal has really been supportive. So um, it takes a team of, of dedicated people. We have mentors in in the schools and and we work with mentors because we had to have people knocking on doors and continue to, to work with our students as they return to school. So um, there is a lot of effort, um, not just all falling on the shoulders of the school adjustment counselors, but of other support staff as well to really help um, students and families transition back to school, feel safe in school, um, process some of the things that they've been through. And then because we know there were some academic struggles as well, it's, it's key to help them to be okay with the fact that they had some struggles and know that those things can be overcome and then put the academic supports in place so that they have an opportunity to close some of those gaps that have occurred while they've been um, trying to manage a world that's very different for them. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I would be happy to either come back and share some more with you or maybe give you some more information now if, if I didn't quite capture what you were looking for. Well, I was wondering, and I, I hope you don't mind if I jump in, Tony. Um, piggybacking off of Mr. Rodriguez's question, do you feel that with the staffing we have and what has already been proposed, and assuming this was all approved, what's already been put in front of us, that we're going to have the people and the professionals that we need to address some of the, the mental health issues that kids are going to be coming back with and, and you know, going forward? I, I think that what we have and what's been proposed will certainly support all of that and support the schools in in having a team of being able to to help students who are going to at various points um, some are going to come in and and adjust and just keep moving forward others are going to need more more assistance and i think the the support that we've been able to put in place the trainings that will uh go with the support with we're doing safety care training we have um dr booth who has come and done a, a number of trainings with the district and by the way is going to do a six-part series um for parents and families uh coming up in april because one of the areas we wanted to also uh, to provide some of the trauma uh, trainings and some of the, the uh, developmental uh, trainings that we've been able to do within the system to also reach out to families and give them access to those as well. So Dr. Booth will be doing a six part training coming up very soon. But yes, I think ultimately uh, we are going to be in a really strong place in terms of counseling service and support in this district uh, better than probably ever before and really at the most important time to be settled in this space because this is a time where we know everything has changed and the more that we have support in place the more we can focus on really building up um, the opportunities for professional growth for those people in those positions and to really um, target um, supporting schools, many of whom are in turnaround. And part of that was about the culture climate of the school, which ties directly to the social emotional support that we're providing. Okay. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Tony, you good for now? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other discussion of this, this agenda item? No. All right. Is there any other business to come before finance this evening? No. All right. Then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn finance. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn by Mrs. Mendez, properly seconded by Mrs. Sullivan. I'll call the roll. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. All right. D'Agostino is a yes. Ms. Asak. Yes. 
Mrs. Mendez. Yes. Mr. Minicello. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. I know he's on a delay. Oh, is he muted? Mr. Sullivan? Yes. There he is. All right. We are adjourned. We'll take a quick break, and uh, then we got to get right back in for our superintendent contract subcommittee. Thank you.